and all of our internet viewers. The Lord bless you today. Shall we stand? We're going to be reading from Ecclesiastes, the King James Version, and then Message Bible. This is a very interesting little verse. Notice carefully. Curse not the king, no, not in thy thought, and curse not the rich in thy bedchamber. For a bird of the air shall carry the voice, and that which hath wings shall tell the matter. Now let's look at uh, the Message Bible, Ecclesiastes 10.20. <laughs> Don't badmouth your leaders, not even under your breath. And don't abuse your betters, even in the privacy of your home. Loose talk has a way of getting picked up and spread around. Little birds drop the crumbs of your gossip far and wide. Isn't that an interesting verse? So we want to talk to you today about beyond the room, beyond the room. Let's pray and ask the Lord to help us today. God, we thank you once again for this privilege of coming into your house and studying your word with your people and our visitors and the internet viewers. We ask you to help us all today with our needs we ask you to enlighten our minds and let our hearts be refreshed by the word. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. The Lord bless you and you may be seated. So good to see each and every one of you today. Hallelujah. What happens and what is said in a room does not always stay within that room. You've heard the statement, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. Well, that's not really true. This was a marketing ploy that Las Vegas came up with, believe it or not, to encourage people to come to their city and do anything they wanted to do without fear of the information getting back home. But this is not realistic. What happens in a room does not stay in that room, and we're going to talk a lot about that. Good or bad, true or false, bits of information have a way of getting out. Have you ever wondered how it would be if the walls of a room could talk? I remember uh, as a kid driving along through wherever we were traveling, and I can remember my dad saying, look at that old house there. Nobody lives there anymore, a deserted farm an old barn that's falling down and a house that's dilapidated. If that house could talk and if that barn could talk, what all would it tell you about the people that lived there and what all went on there? Well, if a room could talk, how many crimes could be solved easily? How many well-guarded secrets would be disclosed. It seems that rooms can talk, for often what is said and done in them is reported well beyond the walls. Some of the broadcasting is intentional, and some of it, of course, is not. Now, how does it get out? Well, this verse says, a bird of the air shall carry the voice. And I suppose that's where the expression comes from. A little bird told me. 
Is that really true? No. Since you can't always find out how information gets out from what is told in confidence within the confines of a room, it is as though a bird causes or at least carries the information and causes the information to be extended. Think about the laws passed by Congress. In their rooms, these laws pass, reach all the way to the very last citizen in the smallest town in the most remote area of the United States. So from the rooms of the Senate and the House, these laws fly and are effective. The purpose of this lesson today is to make us aware that who or what we are, including our reputation and our words, reach far beyond where our lives take place in these rooms every day. We must be well aware of the effect and influence of our lives, that it's not contained just within a room. Listen at Romans 10 and 18. But I say, have they not heard? Yes, verily. Now notice this. Their sound went into all the earth, and their words unto the ends of the world. I was reluctant to tell you about my discouragement, but I'm going to go ahead. In fact, that's why and how this message was birthed. This lesson came out of some frustration this past week. Discouraged with the small attendance of our class compared to the 1045 service. Seems like everybody comes to the 1045 service. And then we get the stragglers uh, who are early for the 1045 service. They come in early, and so after a while, we'll, our, our class will double. And this has been discouraging to me, obviously. I've threatened to give up the class. I've talked to the pastor. But I was reminded that there are people, perhaps many people that are a part of this class that we never see. Now, this doesn't mean we don't appreciate you, the faithful ones. You come and you're here, and we appreciate that so very, very much. But think of the number right now compared to the people that will be in here in just a little while. So I was discouraged and frustrated, but then I got to thinking, Lord, the words we speak and, and what we are trying to project go well beyond this room. Who knows but somebody, somewhere on the Internet, even in another country, because we get reports that people are watching around the world. Somebody will receive something beyond what you folks receive. But somebody out there will get something that perhaps will help them to make it another day or to turn their life around and to live for God. You know, whether we have Internet or not, we must remember this, that, that when we preach, when we teach, when we witness, when we tell someone at home, on the street, wherever, those words do not stop there. Those words go well beyond the room they go beyond. In fact, in that person's heart and mind, those words reside. Can you not remember many things your parents said to you? And perhaps they are gone. My mom and dad are long gone. But oh, how I still can hear mom and dad saying certain things to me. Those words are living on, well beyond the room where we lived in that little 
run-down parsonage in Oklahoma, those words are still being effective. You see, we often allow our responses to be dictated by those present. The audience that we can see. But we must always keep in mind that what we do and say goes well beyond the room. So long after we're dead, long after we're gone, our words will live on. Not only our spoken words, but think about all of our written words. Somebody will pick that material up and read it, and perhaps it will help them. Let's talk about some rooms that did not contain what happened there. You recall that when God told Moses to build the tabernacle, that he built a large fence, and inside the fence, he put a roofed structure, and... He placed a brazen altar where the sacrifices were offered, a laver where the priest could wash, and then a curtained door here where it went into a holy place where there was a candelabra right here that was kept burning, table of showbread with bread on that, and an altar of incense that always had incense burning that gave a good smell and, and all of this that had a ceiling but no floor. But then once a year on October the 10th, the Day of Atonement, the high priest would take blood and sprinkle it not only on the brazen altar, on the labor, on all of these instruments and pieces of furniture, but he would go in here and sprinkle the blood on the Ark of the Covenant, whose lid was the mercy seat. And God dwelt there, the cherubim, and looked down at the blood. And when he saw that blood, he would pass over the sins of Israel. Now, this little room here was approximately... 15 feet by 15 feet by 15 feet. It was a cube. 15 feet. Now, I didn't draw it to scale, obviously. I have kind of a rectangular there, rectangle. But uh, it was 15 feet wide, 15 feet long, and 15 feet high. In a sense, God was confined there. Oh, yes, he fills the universe, but it was there that they had to go to meet God, even if Moses would go meet the Lord. And once in a while he would, not just on October the 10th, but he would go in there and God would talk to him and he would talk to God. But one day God said, I want out. I don't want to stay in this little tiny room for the rest of my life life <laughs> I, I I don't want to be confined I want to be where people can enjoy me so we read in Matthew 27 51 let's look at it and behold the veil of the temple was rent and twain from the top to the bottom and the earth did quake and the rocks rent now remember when Solomon built his temple he did not have a fence like this, but he had the same design with the same pieces of furniture, but exaggerated. This was much bigger, much taller. And so the Holy of Holies, that little room, was not 15 by 15 by 15. It was much larger, but God still, they still, you might say, put him in there. There was the ark, and, and they, he was confined, but... When he was crucified, 
that veil was rent in twain, and he came out of there. Aren't you thankful now that God's out? And not just the high priest on the day of atonement can enjoy fellowship with him or Moses once in a while, but you and I can have almighty God in our hearts and lives. Oh, how thrilling, how wonderful. God is out. He is available. Now, Jesus came and for 33 and a half years he lived and for many years he ministered. In fact, about three and a half years because a priest could not minister until there were 30. Now imagine being almighty God in flesh and you know you're almighty God in flesh and you can't do much about it until you're 30. So when he was 30 years of age, <clears throat> on his 30th birthday, he began to minister. For three and a half years, he ministered. He told the people, one of these days, I'm going to leave here. But I tell you what, I am going to come back and be in you. And, but I want you to go to a little room in Jerusalem, an upper room. And something's going to happen there, and you wait there until it happens. In fact, the, I'm going to bestow on you the promise of, of the Spirit, the Holy Ghost. And, and he told them all about this, so they did. They went there, and they waited for a few days. And, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a brushing mighty wind. It filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared in them cloven tongues like as a fire. And it sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave the utterance. Now, the Bible says when this was noised abroad, when it was noised abroad, how did it get out? It got out of that room. You can't keep it in the room. It went beyond the room. And my hundreds and thousands started receiving this glorious experience. And I suppose since that time, we could probably say millions have received the baptism of the Holy Ghost, and it's still available today. Why? Because it didn't stay in that upper room. No, sir. We better, we better just draw it right here. Now, if you go to Jerusalem, it won't look like this. <coughs> but let's just put an upper room up here. It didn't stay there. It got out. And it is available today for everybody. Isn't that wonderful? Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. And if you don't have the Holy Ghost today, it's available for you. You can have this glorious gift. You can go into the Holy of Holies yourself. You don't need a priest to go for you. You don't need a high priest. You can go and enjoy a relationship with God. God. Oh, let's praise him. Thank you, Lord. We praise you, God, for this possibility. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Now, I want to talk about another room. Revelation 3.20. Behold, I stand at the door of the room and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door of that room, I will come into that room and will sup with him and he with me. Now, what is that room? It's the heart. Oh, hallelujah. So we are able to enjoy God in our heart, in the room of our heart. He will come in and dwell there. And then we must talk about beyond the room <clears throat> we're to let our light shine we're not to keep this light within the room let your light so shine let it go beyond the room ye shall be witnesses unto me so we are to tell folks about this we are to share what we have in our room that was one time locked in a room that came out of a room 
but now is in the room of our heart and needs to be shared with all of those around us. I want to talk a little bit about the record of, of the room. The record of the room. Remember I said that it's impossible to do and to say things in a room and it not to get out. Well, what if somebody never tells is still is out? Because the Bible says that we shall give an account of every deed that's done and every word spoken. Isn't that amazing? You can be on a remote island and be the only one there and be in the only room there and say some things and do some things. And immediately, though there's not a bird, though there's not a press, though there's not an internet, though there's not a telephone, but heaven records everything that happens in that room. See, this is a fearful thing. That's why we cannot get off somewhere in Las Vegas or anywhere else and commit sin and do wrong and, well, nobody will ever know and nobody will ever find out. Listen, heaven is watching all of that. Heaven is recording all of that. I don't know what God's going to do in judgment, but I can just imagine some things. Lord, I think you've got the wrong person. You've got the wrong zip code. Lord, you know my name's Bob. And God, there are about 8 million Bobs right here in the United States. Not only the world, plus all the roosters and mules and donkeys that are named Bob. So God, I don't, you're accusing me of saying some things and doing some, And God said, whoa, 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 whoa. I wonder if God ever stutters. <laughs> Wait just a minute here. some switches and dials, and all of a sudden, here's Bob. And everybody in judgment there, oh, turn it off, God, turn it off. You said it wasn't you. And God just replays my life. Would we have time for that? We've got all eternity. Can God do that? He's got not only, Bob, let me tell you, I not only am going to play this for you, but if you notice right up here on this graph is everything you ever thought. <laughs> so we're not only going to watch a, a, a few years of what you're denying when this happened. We're going we're to see what all you were thinking during that time. Just have a seat there, everybody. Judgment's going to be a fearful thing, God. Does God have all that record? Oh, yes, it goes beyond the room. That's why we can never do anything for God in any way that will go unnoticed. We told you before <clears throat> about Brother Larson, Columbia. How Brother Larson went there with his wife and and uh, I believe, I believe in childbirth, maybe she died. He preached for five, I believe it was seven years, if I remember the story correctly, without one convert in Columbia. And his wife died. There was no one to preach her funeral. The Catholic Church would not let him bury her in the cemetery because he was Pentecost. He preached her funeral dug her grave out behind the church, built the casket, put her body in it, and drug the casket out behind the church and buried it. No converts. The devil probably said, what are you doing here, Larson? I'm working for God. See, this is when I start feeling real convicted when I don't have a whole bunch in here on Sunday morning like after a while they'll be in here. Brother Larson didn't have anybody, but he just kept on, kept on, kept on. 
And Sister Hinnell could tell us this morning of the amazing numbers. What are they saying? Is it uh, with both organizations around 2 million or so? More than that. Oh, God. More than that. Jesus' name, Holy Ghost, oneness, fill people in, in Columbia as a result because Brother Larson went there as a pioneer missionary and was faithful. He's dead and gone. He doesn't know this unless God tells him. But one day he'll find out. One day we'll find out all that we have done. <coughs> now, I've, I've turned the page to page six, and I've got some things here that I was reluctant to tell you. Number one, I've told you before. And number two, I, I, I hate to call attention to what we have done, which is so little. But uh, let me just give these as an example, if I may. <clears throat> Many years ago, my wife and I, while evangelizing, we saw some a young couple, uh, friends of ours, and uh, they were about to have a baby, their first baby. They were evangelizing. They were struggling financially. They did not have the finance for the baby. This was years ago. And uh, so my wife and I felt led to give them $100. So we gave them $100 and uh, went on our way, and they went on their way. Years and years and years and years passed. This good man, this preacher, went on and founded a church in one of our larger cities of the United States. And I went on the Internet this week to be sure because I had heard a vast number. And the Internet said that he has 14,000 members. 14,000 members, this young evangelist. They run 8,000 in their church, and then the satellite churches that he has, a total of 14,000. <clears> he appears on television. His ministry is known around the world. I was at a funeral not too awful long ago, and he and his wife happened to be there. And what was interesting, we all showed up, several ministers, it was a nearby restaurant, we all showed up at the same restaurant, and so we just had a good time visiting. Before we left, he told his wife, he said, I want you to write them a check. We looked at that check, and ladies and gentlemen, it was $1,000. And I said, oh, and I called my friend's name. I said, that, what, what's, what's going on? He said, listen, let me tell you something. He said, when you helped me and my wife, when we didn't have enough money to have that baby, and you gave us $100, he said, that 100 way back there is well worth $1,000 or more today. Now, forgive me for telling something so personal. I didn't want to tell you to let us know we gave $100. But I wanted you to see. We didn't even think about that. We didn't sit around and say, oh, boy, he's got a big old church now. I wonder if he's ever going to kind of feed a little, send a little of that money our way since we helped him. Oh, no. We were so thrilled. But look what God did. If you will pay your tithes, if you will give offerings, if you will love folks, if you will witness to people, if you will help somebody, you may never get a return as far as you know. You may never see the results of that. But God has a record. It goes beyond that room. And he remembers that. Now I've told you this before and I'm going to relate the story. I'll, I may shorten it. But one of the most encouraging things in my life as far as doing something and not realizing what it was going to come of it is the Les Clevenger story. In the late 60s and early 70s, 
we were pastoring a small church in Oklahoma. I went out one day to knock doors on a Saturday to try to get Sunday school kids to come the next morning. I knocked on a the door. They invited me in. Here sat a little fellow with long hair strumming some rock music on a guitar. Little brothers and sisters kind of dirty and pitiful around there in the room. I don't know where the daddy was. The mama was somewhere back there. And so I uh, said, boys and girls, would you all like to come to Sunday school in the morning? Yeah. This boy playing the guitar was about 15 or 16. He was the oldest. And though they asked Mama, and Mama said, well, yeah, I don't mind if you pick them up. So went the next morning and picked them up for Sunday school. They started coming. Leslie became, I suppose, the most faithful young person I've ever pastored. He didn't, he was poor, and his daddy, stepdaddy was mean to him, and hide the toilet paper from the kids because they was using too much toilet paper. Wouldn't give them any toilet paper. And wouldn't buy school books. I'd buy school books sometimes for him. And just pitiful. One morning he, he, he ran, he ran several blocks on a frosty morning holding his shoes in his hand because he didn't want to mess his shoes up. And uh, faithful to God. Love the Lord. I've never seen anybody love God so. Well, after several years, he grew up and got married, or rather he grew up and, and joined the army and was in Okinawa and uh, was married. And while in Okinawa, he had a child, Les Jr. And uh, he called me one night, Les did, Les Sr., and, and uh, the Holy Ghost was working on him. He had drifted away from the Lord, and he's, of course, serving the Lord now in Oklahoma in a church there. But <clears throat> uh, we've stayed in contact over the years. Well, he moved back to Oklahoma, and Les Jr. grew up and got the Holy Ghost and decided to want to go to Bible school. So he went to Gateway. While at Gateway, he met a girl from the East Coast that got married. They both had a burden for missions. Leslie wanted to go back to Okinawa where he was born. And today, Leslie Clevenger and his wife are missionaries in Japan. They left Okinawa and went on up in the main island of Japan. They're missionaries in Japan. And I look back and I think, oh God, that day, that day, knocking doors, trying to find people for Sunday school and found little long-haired hippie Leslie. Little did I know that something was going to go beyond that room and from Leslie would be a young kid that would grow up and marry and be a missionary in Japan. You see... Sometimes when we get frustrated and discouraged and we think we're doing so little for God, we need to remember that no matter what we do or say for God, it's on record. It's stacking up. It's, it's accumulating. You talk about money accumulating with interest. Listen, whatever we do for God, it, think of Cornelius. What he did went beyond that room. It was a memorial that went even up to God. And the Bible tells us in Revelation that prayers never die. Prayers never die. So once you pray, once you witness, I don't think you ever read a scripture that God doesn't keep track of all of that. We're reading the Bible through again this year. And uh, my... You know, sometimes you, I tell people when they read the genealogy, and I said, instead of reading every word, just scan that. Just go, ooh, ooh. I just scan it because my eyes are seeing it. You don't have to say Adonijah, Mephibosheth, and try to pronounce every word. You'll go crazy. 
just skip through all that genealogy real quick. But I believe, the reason why I mention that, I believe God will even give you credit for reading genealogy. There's a blessing for reading the Word of God. There's a blessing for witnessing. There's a blessing for being faithful. You being here today, you know, in some Sunday school classes, we, we kept role and had membership and, and attendance, you know, and all of that. And I thought about that here, but it's so hard. It's so hard here. I mean, do we count all those who come in a little bit early for service, you know? How do we have a... So I just try to do my best for Jesus, and, and, and he knows. But, but you know what? God has a record of this class. You get to heaven. He will tell you who was early and who was late. He'll tell you who came five minutes before and got. I don't know if he'll count it. He might count those. We, we usually do. <laughs> we used to count them in Sunday school or church on a Sunday morning. If they got there before we, before we read the, the report. But anyway, God keeps track of all of that. He knows where you sit. I know where you sit. But God really knows where you sit. Now, the law said they're sitting back there. They're usually up here, but they were wait, waiting on Brenda and John. And Brenda and John haven't, haven't made it yet, but bless their hearts. Having lost their mother, Sister Agnew passed away this week. And, and so they're waiting on them. But, but God knows he knows that the laws are usually right up here, and uh, he keeps track of all of this. So don't ever feel, God, what am I doing? My wife has felt so, <clears throat> so what would be the word, useless or ineffective? Not useless, maybe, but ineffective. She was a pastor's wife for all those years, <clears throat> and Sister Jean. McKellar, pastor's wife for all those years. But now we're in a church and not a pastor's wife. So my wife has felt like, what am I doing? That's one reason she sings in the choir. She's the oldest. She's an old lady up there, <laughs> barely able to climb the stairs. <laughs> oh, she said she can do it good. Yeah, she, <laughs> she, she climbs the stairs. She just skips up them. She's the oldest lady up there. Why do you sing in the choir? I want to do something. And she tries to encourage folks and help folks, but, but sometimes we don't feel like we're doing much. But whatever we do. Hallelujah. It's under the Lord. And he keeps track of it, and it goes beyond the room. And we're going to give today that the offering may go beyond the room and go to the power companies and insurance and buy Sunday school literature that we don't use and so forth in this class. In Jesus' name, thank you, Lord bless you. Sunday school offering, thank you. So let's remember to be faithful, to be faithful to God because what we're doing, do it is living on and on and on. I look at men like Brother McKellar, who's pastored several churches, evangelized for many years, and been so faithful. And I'm sure he and he and I talk a lot. We we feel like sometimes, you know, what what have we done? What have we really accomplished? If we could only go back, and then I, I look at Brother McMahon and how faithful he's been and his pastoring and and the good work that he's done and just we all feel like, what are we doing and, and what are we accomplishing? And, and does God know? And, but listen, he does. He does. And one of these days, we're going to stand up there and receive a reward for our faithfulness. Glory, glory, glory. Thank you, Jesus. Now, some men like Anthony Mangan, you know, he, he can be ministering over there to 2,000 this morning. And, and some of our pastors are ministering to two. I've ministered to two and three and four in, in houses, in the living room. But guess what? It doesn't matter the number. If we'll be faithful, it goes beyond the room. Let's stand and thank the Lord. Let's stand and ask him to help us to be faithful and help us to remember that we have an influence. 
our words and our actions and deeds are going beyond the room. God, we love you. We thank you. Help us to be faithful. Forgive us for getting discouraged. Forgive us, Lord, for feeling like we're not doing anything. Help us to do whatever our hands find to do, and you will reward accordingly. We love you in Jesus' name. God bless you. You're dismissed until the big powwow at 1045. <laughs>